All right, so uh, today we're gonna switch topics to actual optics, which I'm sure you've been looking forward to. Um, and for this whole week, I guess, we're gonna talk about ray optics. And let me motivate this a little bit. So, so Maxwell's equations, of course, are, are really where it's at. You know, you, we took uh, electromagnetism class. Many of you either have taken the senior electromagnetism class or will soon. All of optics is, is really just Maxwell's equations. But the problem is that solving Maxwell's equations in different situations is, is not particularly easy. And knowing what even to, what questions to even ask is, is not particularly easy. And, and that's where a lot of the kind of special situations and approximations that we'll make in, in optics lab come into play. So, you know, uh, there's a couple approximations that we'll make. And, and today, today we'll talk about ray optics, which is sort of the oldest and simplest view of optics that, that it turned out to be compatible with Maxwell's equations in a lot of situations. But other approximations we'll make are, for example, looking only at light of a particular wavelength and asking what happens when you have light of only a particular wavelength, a particular color. And this is an approximation because no real system, even the best, most expensive, fanciest laser is truly exactly one wavelength. There's always a, a little bit of spread in wavelength. And, and so that, you know, thinking about things in, in terms of one wavelength is one approximation. Thinking about things in terms of plane waves is another approximation. As waves travel through a system, they're never infinitely big. Uh, and th there'll be a few others like that that we make, but uh, today we're gonna, we're gonna focus on, on ray optics. Let, let me say, even, even within quantum mechanics, if, uh, if you take Jedi quantum and we learn about quantum optics, how to really quantize the electromagnetic field, Maxwell's equations are still the starting point. You still use Maxwell's equations to find the modes of the system, the, the set of you know, whatever boundary conditions you have in, in the world or in your uh, lab setup. You still use Maxwell's equations to find the, the traveling waves or the standing waves that have a particular frequency. So those are the modes. And then once you've done all the classical Maxwell's equation stuff, then you quantize the energy stored in each of these modes as in multiples of, of HF or H bar omega. So, so even, even in Jedi quantum, the first step is Maxwell's equation. So, re so really Maxwell's equations are where it's at. But uh, today we're gonna focus on this limit of solutions in Maxwell's equations that, that captures a lot of everyday optical phenomena. And, and this works in cases uh, where there are clearly defined wave fronts and there's not a lot of interference or diffraction, which we'll talk about later. So let me just draw, what, what are these rays? Well, if you have some source, like a, a filament of a light bulb that's really tiny, and again, imagine it's emitting one wavelength instead of lots and lots and lots of wavelengths. But you look at what's coming out of these, uh, out of the source, you get these spherical waves that are expanding. And if you just take the, uh, the normal for these spherical waves, the direction of expansion here, that, that will become the, the rays that we worry about in, in ray optics. So in any model where there are clearly defined wave fronts, with, uh, with waves moving out or moving sideways. Um, and, and there's not situations where you've got two sources kind of equally contributing where we might get interference. Uh, the, this ray approximation is, is pretty good. And certainly for all of the optical devices we typically think of like cameras and eyeglasses and projectors and stuff like that. Ray optics is an excellent, excellent uh, uh, tool for that. And even when we do get into the more complicated situations, often it's best to first analyze things in the ray approximation to see roughly what's going on and then add on the other effects. So what, what exactly is this, is this model? So I, um, okay, so what exactly is the ray model? Well, the ray model is that rays, these, these rays here travel through
through clear, clear media like vacuum or air or water or glass or acrylic um, at, at speed C naught, the speed of light in vacuum over N, the index of refraction of the material. So N equals one for vacuum and N is always greater than one for everything else, for all else. So the index of refraction of water is something like 1.3 maybe, and glass tends to be around 1.4 or 1.5. Different glasses have different index indices of refraction. Uh, but the idea is that as these waves travel through clear media, their wave fronts slow down by this factor, and we'll treat the rays as propagating through this media at a slower speed. And the main principle of ray optics is called Fermat's principle. which informally says that light takes the path of least time. So the, whatever complicated situation of different materials you have, light is gonna take the paths that take the least amount of time. Now, more formally, that, that's not exactly true. It's more of an uh, extremum. So uh, it could be a maximum or a, uh, an inflection point or a saddle point, or sorry, a, uh, a minimum or an inflection or a saddle point. It's usually not a maximum. And I'll, I'll show you why in a second. The idea is that if you had some, some starting point A and some starting point B, and you imagine that we're in some, some material with some varying index of refraction. I don't, I don't know exactly how I want to draw this material. I, I'll use a different color because it's not, not wave fronts. Imagine that uh, you start out in air and then there's a bunch of high index of refraction material here and some maybe low index of refraction material here and maybe it's continuously changing. Then the light tries all different paths and it will pick out the path that has the least time. So let's be a little formal about that. Let's, let's write down the time. The time is actually some integral of little time elements from A to B, and each little time element is some length element over the velocity. And the velocity is C naught over N. So I can substitute that in. Go from A to B, DS, C naught over N. Now, again, if you have some material whose index of refraction varies either discontinuously or continuously as you, as you tra travel. Um, this, this can be a function of R, the coordinate along which you're calculating these paths. And finally, we can just take one over C naught out and write this as the integral from A to B of N of R ds. And this whole integral here, not including the one over C naught, N is dimensionless. This has units of length. This whole thing has units of length. This is called the optical path length. Optical path length. Okay. A little hard to write over there on the side. All right. So the optical path length takes into account the fact that Sometimes it's traveling through denser material with some high index of refraction. And because N is always bigger than or equal to one, depending on where you're traveling, this optical path length is always bigger than or equal to the real path length, which is what you would get if you did this integral without, uh, without the factor of N. And Fermat's last principle, <laughs> Fermat's last, Fermat's principle says that uh, small variations in this path, delta T, lead to zero change. Small variations in this path lead to zero change in the amount of time. So 
this is very much like uh, in Theomec, you know, so it's a variational principle, like uh, small variations of the path that a particle takes lead to zero change of the Lagrangian. That's the principle of least action. Uh, here are the same thing. Small variations in this path lead to zero first order changes in the time. And that's the principle of least time. And I, I will never give you some problem where there's some complicated continuous uh, index of refraction gradient that light has to travel through. You know, one, one example of that, I suppose, um, we won't calculate this, but one example is you can imagine a, if this is Earth here, and you have a, a telescope on Earth that's looking up. So let's say the telescope is, is at the North Pole and there's some satellite or a star that's over here. And the Earth is surrounded by atmosphere. And as you know from, from StatMech, the atmosphere has some gradient that gets thinner and thinner and thinner as you go up. It's roughly falls off exponentially. You could use this to calculate the, the path, uh, you know, the direction that you would actually have to point the telescope in order to see the satellite or the star. And if you, if you do this, um, here's how you have to you have to look slightly up and then it'll bend, it'll bend over and then it'll go straight once it sort of leaves the leaves the atmosphere. So this this deviation from from the atmosphere is is really tiny, but you can calculate it using this this principle. But we won't focus much on these, these situations with some uh, continuous gradient of index of refraction. We'll focus on the more common situation where we have homogeneous media and transitions from homogeneous media to other homogeneous media. So let me talk about that next. And, and we won't even really ever do a proper integral like this. We'll, we'll just argue uh, from kind of the, the principle itself, what, what path things should take. So let me, let me get rid of this picture first. I guess what maybe intuitively, why does it bend like this? Well, you're minimizing the optical path length and the optical path length is longer when you're in the dense atmosphere. So you wanna get out of the dense atmosphere as quickly as possible and then take the straight line path. So this is the, the, the path that kind of gets out sooner and then takes a straight line path. Of course, it's not, you don't go straight up and then over just like all these variational principle problems, there's always some trade-off here, but that's, that's why it, uh, it takes a path that kind of tilts, tilts up more first and then goes over. All right, okay. so the first situation we'll consider is homogeneous media. With, with index of fraction n. So you can imagine some homogeneous media here and I'll just draw it as some, you know, it's clear, it's glass or water say, but if we have, if we have A and B here, here's A, here's B, how does this look on the, yeah. here's B. Um, if it's homogeneous, it all has the same index of refraction. And so the shortest time to go from A to B would just be a straight line. Any deviation from that is gonna be a longer path. And you, you could do a Theomech-like problem to prove that the straight line is the shortest distance path, but it's, it's pretty obvious that for homogeneous media, the, the straight lines are the shortest path. So, so we'll, uh, we will take the rays to travel as in straight paths within any homogeneous media. All right, so situation number two is a, a simple mirror. Let me back. So a plane mirror. So 
Uh, let's draw it like this. So here's your mirror. And let's imagine you have uh, some point up here A and some point down here B. And we, we want to consider the paths that bounce off the mirror. And there's a bunch of different paths, but let's just take, actually, let me draw B slightly asymmetrically here. I draw B way down here. So it, it's, uh, no, I didn't leave myself much room. And you can't see it on the screen anyway. I draw B really close then. There's B. Just so that the two paths aren't the same. Uh, and you could ask what where along here, so within the within the free space, these are gonna propagate as straight lines, but where along the mirror would a light ray hit in order to, to make it to be? You can imagine having a laser pointer and you shine it at different angles, and only one of those angles is gonna hit B. And you can work out if you look at the normal here. We call this the theta incident, theta i, and we call this one theta r. And you can work out that the minimum path, but you know, by varying this point up and down, you can work out that the, the minimum path length happens when these angles are the same. You can imagine some other path here, this dotted path that hits the mirror up there. Any of those other dotted paths are going to be longer. And uh, this is just a simple, uh, simple calculus problem because there's only one parameter that we're varying. It's not a, uh, it's not a stat mech uh, variational principle kind of problem. We're not varying a whole path. We're assuming that there are straight paths within the media. And so the path of least time is is the the place where the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. Uh, just from the Pythagorean theorem. All right, so, so some might, might ask, well, what about this direct path? Isn't there a direct path from A to B? Wouldn't that be shorter? And that, that's why we, we have to formulate Fermat's principle a little bit more carefully. Yes, if you, if you shine the, the laser from A to B, that is also a valid path. And, that, and there is a, a, a path that goes directly from A to B around which variations would lead to longer paths. So uh, just because there there's a, a local minimum here, and this is the global minimum also. There's also a local minimum bouncing off of here. It's not the global minimum, but it's still a valid path. It's still an extremum, right? This sort of extreme, uh, extremizing some quantity with respect to path only gives you local extrema, a local minimum, local maximum, local saddle point, local inflection. Uh, you know, why, why don't we ever worry about local maxima? Well, for any, any given path, there's always a longer path that's right next to it. So we're never gonna find a path that's, that's a, a local maxima for, for optics. We're, we're only gonna find uh, inflection points or, or minima. Uh, okay, so that's, that's a plain mirror. I guess one, one question might also be, why did I draw a normal here rather than, why don't I draw a normal and worry about the angles with respect to the normal, rather than worry about the angles with respect to the mirror itself, which might be the more obvious thing to do at first. And the reason for that is that mathematically, if the mirror isn't straight, it's often easier to specify a normal than it is to specify uh, well, it, the, the normal is, is often unambiguous. So if you had a a curve mirror and say it wasn't a spherical, it was just some random curve. And you had some A, and some B over here. And you would ask what, what path does the light take? Uh, for any curve, it's sort of very easy to specify the normal. It's easy to take, take angles from the normal. So here, theta incidence and theta reflect, uh, theta incident, theta reflection would be uh, would be the same. Now, there are, uh, again, going back to why the naive version of a, a, a least time path is, is not, not quite the right version and this sort of more sophisticated 
local minima, uh, you know, variations of path give you zero. Why that's the more sophisticated way to go. What happens if the surface is curved in some more complicated way, such there are a lot of minima? Well, if there are a lot of minima, all of those are valid paths. So say, say if I had some A, some B here, and my surface was more, uh, more reflective, like, uh, more uh, curved like this, and there'd be a lot of different places where this would be true. And you would get reflections off of each of these probably, the right point. So you get one, one path there, that is a valid path. And all paths that are nearby would, would not be as short. There's also, you'd also see a reflection from this surface here and nearby paths would not quite be as short. You'd see a reflection from this surface here. So again, it's not, it doesn't seek out some global minima. It, it just seeks out the, the place where there are local minima or local extreme points. All right, and a uh, slightly more complicated example of this is here I had a surface that was curved in this sort of sine kind of way and there were some discrete, discrete minima. You could also have whole regions that are equally minimal. And examples of that would be the following. Again, while I'm erasing, it's an excellent time to ask questions. So maybe I just didn't hear something, but like intuitively, I get why it would sort of why light would seek out the shortest path, but I don't see, I don't quite understand like really why it does that. Oh, do you understand? If you, if you understand it intuitively, I would love to hear that intuition. Well, no, I'm not I sure I understand like, it intuitively. Yeah. Um, the answer to really why does it do that? There, there are sort of different levels of of depth uh, as to why that really happens. And one, one level of depth is to actually solve the uh, Maxwell's equations for, for light that's expanding out. So you see some, some uh, uh, spherical wave coming, coming off of A and if you, eventually that spherical wave will, or well, it won't be spherical when it hits B, but there'll be some, some waves hitting B here. And if you trace back the, the, the paths of all these waves that eventually kind of come to hit B, and you always look at the normal of all those waves, you, you find that uh, it, it, it will obey this principle. I'm not sure I've ever really seen that proof explicitly, but uh, since, since these rays are just normals to the actual electromagnetic wave that's coming off of A and landing on B, that, that must be the case. You must be able to derive this from Maxwell's equations. In physics 51, we took a different approach, which was to consider um, consider the uh, interference so again, this is sort of, this is one way of calculating the, the net effect of all of the waves going in all the directions. If you have some, some A here and some B here, let me draw the situation again. We, we consider this in the context of quantum mechanics, but this is in, in physics 51, but this is also a perfectly valid thing to do in any situation where you have a wave equation is to say that each of these potential paths comes with some e to the i uh, path length. Uh, let me see. So two, it would be two pi uh, path length L over wavelength of light lambda. So each path comes with some complex number that's related to uh, to the length of the path. And you can add up all the path lengths. And what you find is that 
the path lengths that are near some sort of uh, local minima, if you think about these all as phasers, say they, they're little arrows in the complex plane that point in some direction, around where there's a local minima, the you're adding up a whole bunch of different path lengths that are all roughly the same length. And so you're adding up a whole bunch of arrows that are all roughly pointing in the same direction. Maybe they move a little bit. So you get a big contribution from all the paths around here. But as soon as you get off, off of uh, near the minimum, you start adding up arrows that are all kind of rotating pretty quickly. And so the, the paths that are not near the minimum all end up with kind of random, random phases that add up to nothing, uh, nothing much net here. And I could do the same thing over here. As I get far away from the minima, these things start to start to end up just being a whole slew of random phases that are all pointing in random directions and they don't all contribute very much. And so you could say that from this picture, you see if I just ignore all of these, this whole mess of random phases that come from considering paths that do something random, and I only look at paths near a local minimum, only looking at paths near the local minimum gives me almost all of the answer that, that I need. So, so these all constructively interfere in a particular way. And far away, these all destructively interfere with each other. And so the only paths that really count uh, are paths that, that are uh, close to some local minima. So that's, that's another way of, of looking at it. Um, I think originally this, this principle was just formulated as a, a single unifying principle that could explain all kinds of things like this ang angles of reflection. And we'll see in a minute, it can explain uh, Snell's law, the, what, what happens at an interface between two different indices of refraction. Um, this was initially formulated as a unifying principle that, that would explain all those things, but it has several several deeper explanations. One in terms of waves, which I, I've never really seen explicitly why, why uh, the shortest path ends up giving you wave fronts that are perpendicular. Although maybe there's some geometric argument, I have to think about that. Or this more uh, kind of phase, phase picture where uh, every, every possible path contributes equal magnitude here, whatever that magnitude is. Z, Z naught, it's just some, some constant magnitude here. They all contribute the same magnitude, but they all come with different, different phases. And if you add them all up, I guess this is some like infinitesimal, infinitesimal magnitude. And you add them all up and it turns out to be only the ones that are roughly near a minimum that count. Um, this has a special name in, in complex analysis. And I, I forget exactly what this is, where if you, if you have some e to the i, some function here, and you, you add up a whole bunch of these things along some path, dz along some path, um, a very good approximation to this is to just look at the extrema of this function and add up the, the situations just around, around the extrema. Uh, does anyone, has anybody taken complex analysis and do you, did you talk about this? I think I only encountered it in some math. Saddle, saddle point? Yeah, yeah, it has something to do with saddle point. I don't know if that's, certainly you're looking for the saddle points of this function f when you're doing this integral. Um, so I don't know if that helped. I, the, the, it, it, intuitively there's some nice appeal. Historically, it was just because it was a single principle that explained a lot of optical phenomena and the deeper explanations all have to do with these, uh, either, you know, waves, Maxwell's equation geometries, or sort of, I don't know, for lack of a better term, saddle point ex complex exponential integrals. 
All right, so let me let me show you a situation where there's not a single a single local minima or a discrete series of local minima, but there's a whole continuous continuous set of paths that all have basically the same uh, the same optical path length. So this these really are saddle points or inflection points in, in this this math sense. They're they're uh, they're extrema in the sense that varying the path leads to zero variation, but they're not literally local minima or maxima. So simplest example of that would be a sphere. And if your source is at the center of the sphere, it's not a very good sphere. Draw a little bit more symmetrically. If source is at the center of the sphere, then the any path that goes directly to the wall and comes back it's going to have the same path length as any path that goes directly to this wall and comes back, or goes directly to this wall and comes back. So, so because these are all uh, equal, they're all extrema. If I if I were to rotate this angle a little bit, it would make zero difference in the optical path length. So all of these are valid paths. If you have a little flash at the center, it will go out to the walls and come back and focus back at the center. And maybe a little bit more interestingly, if you have an ellipse, then you have some point A and B. One of the definitions of an ellipse, or one of the ways to draw an ellipse, is to take some string of some length uh, that's longer than this length, and hang it between A and B. And the total length of all of these different paths here is always going to be exactly the same no matter where you go along this ellipse. So if I were to take a string of a certain distance or of a certain length and just hold a pencil here and kind of go go around as much as I could, I would I would draw an ellipse. It's one of the definitions of, of the geometry of an ellipse. And so that what that means is that all of these total path lengths, this plus that, or this plus that, or this plus that, are all the same. And so that means that these are all valid paths, which means that if you had a little flash at A, it would expand and it would hit the wall all at different times, but it would focus back to B. You can imagine all these paths uh, all contribute to, uh, to the light that hits B. And of course, there's some direct path, but even the direct path, if it passes through B and, and reflects off the back wall and comes back, that will, that will happen at the same time as all these other indirect paths. Uh, and finally, there's a parabola. Let me draw that down here. And uh, if you if there's some focus of the parabola, A, and if you shine light from the focus of the parabola, it'll bounce off. And just sort of by the geometrical definition of the parabola, no matter where you shine the light, it's always going to bounce off going straight up. So if I, if I were to shine it this way, it would bounce off going straight up here. So all of these are also valid paths, B prime. So depending on, on where you uh, launched your light, what direction you launched your light from A, these are all valid paths. Light could take any of these paths and, and make it up to, to B. So uh, and in any, if you were to, to vary, vary any of this distance here uh, and still try to make it to the same point, you would find that those would be longer paths than than the path that has a uh, perfectly vertical line here. So just from Fermat's principle, you can work out the reflection and in geometry, you can work out the reflection of a lot of these, a lot of these situations. All right. So the the sort of thing that really convinced people that this was the right way of looking things, or you know uh, maybe not the right a a useful way of looking at things, is to ask what happens at an interface between two different indices of refraction. I'll talk about that for a little bit. All right, so imagine you have two different materials. 
with index of refraction N1 and N2. This can be air and water or water and glass or glass and a different glass and anything with two different indices, uh, indices of refraction. And you start at A, which I'll give coordinates this time, zero, zero, so I can actually derive something. And you, you launch a array up, up here. Um, two things will happen. One thing will be that when there's ever, when the, when there's a, ever an interface, you'll get some amount of reflection. And we already talked about what angle that reflection will come off at. And I, I don't know if I drew it quite equal, but uh, you imagine that array will come off at, at some equal uh, angle here. So let me call this theta one. This will also be theta one from before. And, but light will also go into the, the media if it's clear. Now we need Maxwell's equations to work out what fraction of light reflects and what fraction of light goes into the media. And the more different these indices of refraction are, the more reflection you get. But for, for now, let's not worry about the relative amounts. Let's just worry about the geometry. If I were to shine a laser at this thing at some angle, where does it come out? Let me extend my normal. And let me imagine just for just for the picture here, let me imagine that this is bigger than N1. It'll turn out that this, this ray coming in will come out at a shallower angle. Let me call this theta two. This is also theta one. Okay, and let's let's imagine that it hits hits B here, point B. And let me give this coordinates. Uh, let me give this coordinates. Uh, a and B, and let me give this final destination coordinates C and D. And what we want to do is we want to slide, slide this point around. And as we slide the point around, um, the goal is to hit B. As we slide the point around, this, this thing is going to slide with it, but we don't care about that. We just care about what, what angle here uh, hits B. And, and you know that it curves in because you could think about it like uh, like these calculus of variation problems where you have a, a lifeguard who needs to run from A across sand and then swim to a person who's located at B and the lifeguard can run much faster across sand and, and they can swim through the water. And, and that's just like the light here. If if this is like say say air, if this is air, and this is glass, then the light can go much faster through through air. And so this path can be a little bit longer uh, and, and uh, the light travels slower through B, uh, slower through the, the water so, uh, or the glass. So you, so you want to make this path shorter. But you know, the, the shortest path to go through the water would be to go straight straight over, but then you spend a lot of time in the air. So there's some there's some trade-off here that that maximizes or that, that minimizes the total time it takes to get from here to here. And all we need to do is just calculate this total optical path length and then vary it with respect to the, the y coordinate here b and, and see what we get. And that'll tell us the angle. So let me let me just go through that calculation. The total optical path length L. This is just the index of refraction in the first media times this distance here. And this distance is just the square root of a squared plus b squared, since I've labeled this coordinate 0, 0, uh, plus n2, that's the index of refraction here, times this distance. And this distance is just a little bit more complicated. Let me, uh, I might run out of room here, but let me just write in two steps. So this is c minus a squared plus d minus b squared. OK, good. That fit on the screen. And now we want to vary b and ask, where does this have a minimum? So all we do is we just take the partial derivative of l with respect to b, and we set this, set this equal to 0. Well, this first one, I'm going to take the derivative here. Um, I get a half coming down and, and minus a half. And if I write this out, I get n1 over 
the square root of a squared plus b squared. And then the derivative of what's inside gives me a b up here. Uh, the two that I get from taking the derivative of what's inside cancels the half I get from taking the derivative of the square root. Um, over here, I'm taking the derivative with respect to b, so this first term doesn't matter, it's just this one. Uh, because there's a minus here, when I end up taking the derivative, I get a minus sign. So here I get n2 d minus b over the square root of this, this whole square root. So c, c minus a squared plus b minus b squared. Okay. And now I want to turn this into geometry. So I have a bunch of lengths. These are the hypotenuse. And, and b is the uh, b is the height here. And so just by similar angles, this is also theta 1. And so this is opposite over hypotenuse. This is n1 sine of theta 1 minus and two, d minus b is just this distance here. So this distance here is, uh, is d minus b. So again, it's opposite over opposite over hypotenuse, sine of theta two. And so we get the net result is is uh, Snell's law, which you may have seen in other contexts. N one sine theta one equals n two sine theta two. So this will tell us if, if we shoot light at a particular angle with respect to the normal, what angle does it come out in the, uh, in the media? And just for the picture, I, I drew n2 bigger than n1, but it, this equation is, is symmetric. It doesn't, it doesn't care uh, which one is actually bigger. So that's, uh, that's Snell's law. Um, maybe I will wait on the next topic until next lecture. So uh, we've sort of established uh, the, the fundamental rule of ray optics, which is Fermat's principle that things take an extrema of time. We've gone through a whole bunch of different situations. And from here on out, we're gonna throw out Fermat's principle and just work with the situations that, that we described the, for, for mirrors, the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection, and for uh, for an interface between two different media, the uh, Snell's law gives you the angles, and then we'll, we'll work out how how other optical components like lenses work from from this next time. So let me take questions in the last three minutes. Maybe I'll let you go a little bit early today. All right, no pressing questions. Maybe you get to have a slightly longer than normal break before we talk about uh, next time, which is sort of lenses and uh, rays along a particular optical system rather than just generic rays in, in three-dimensional space. All right, so I'll see you all in two days. I've posted homework two. Um, I'm not sure you can do much with homework two yet, although I doubt many people will. I think after Wednesday's lecture, you'll be able to, to really start at least half of that homework.